Greetings. Hello to everybody. I hope you can all hear me. Um, my name is Lynn Viola. I'm uh, uh, a university professor emerita from the history department, and I am delighted to welcome you to uh, the um, seminar today. It's the Edward and Bell Freed Memorial Lecture. Um, at the Anne Tonnenbaum Center for Jewish Studies. Now, before we begin, uh, I would like to acknowledge this land on which the University of Toronto operates. For thousands of years, it has been the traditional land of the Euro and Dot, the Seneca and the Mississaugas of the Credit. Today, this meeting place is still the home of many indigenous people uh, from across Turtle Island. And we are grateful to have the opportunity to work on this land. I would also like to extend a special and warm welcome to Mr. Lauren Freeds, uh, here representing the Freed family. The generous gift that made this lecture possible was given by the estate of Michael Freed, Lauren's late brother, in honor of their late parents. Edward and Bell. Edward was a survivor of both Auschwitz and Mauthausen and immigrated to Canada in 1948. He created a successful life for himself and his family. This fund was created to support student, graduate student research and public programming in the field of Holocaust studies and education. Thank you. Uh, okay, so today's speaker um, is no stranger to the U of Toronto. Uh, Dr. Anna Haikova is uh, our former student, first of all. Uh, uh, and she is now an associate professor at the University of Warwick, where she co-directs the Center for Global Jewish Studies. Her book, The Last Ghetto, An Everyday History of Theresian Schott, came out in 2020 with Oxford University Press. It's a stunning work of history. Uh, it's pioneering uh, and I highly recommend that you read it. Um, Dr. Heikova is a pioneer of queer Holocaust history and her work has been awarded the 2020 Orfeo Iris Prize. So without any further ado, Dr. Heikova. I'm so glad it's not me. <laughs> Thank you so much, Lynn, for this wonderful introduction. Thank you to you and to Anna Stanches for inviting me, to Constance Chan and Galena Weissmann for organizing my talk. Um, and thank you all for coming today. It is a special pleasure to introduce my book to the colleagues of Toronto because this was the intellectual home that the book came to be. Um, it is also the home to many people who really shaped the book, most of all Doris Bagan, who was my doctoral supervisor, the former director of the Center for Jewish Studies, uh, Derek Penzler, and of course, Lynn. So the book, which I believe Noam Citrin has all of two copies to sell. Noam, can you? Yes, there's Noam. The books are there. They're only $40. It's a great book. Um, the book is more seriously doing two things. Uh, I set it out to write a new analytical history of Theresienstadt. Uh, most of the books before were written by survivors. I'm obviously not a survivor. Those of my relatives who were imprisoned in Theresienstadt did not survive. So in that sense, the narratives that emerge with the survival community did not impact me or did not impact me directly. But moreover, the book is also trying to write a case history of society in extremists. I was always interested, like when you go to the talks on say the Werner Scholem or whatever, if you're not interested in Werner Scholem, what does the book actually tell you about bigger topics? So in a way I'm trying to answer to the question is what was the society of Holocaust victims and what can be gleaned from Holocaust history for the big history, um, because sometimes there is not quite as much engagement between the bigger general history and Holocaust history. So in the following 45 minutes, I want to introduce some of the key themes of my book. I cannot introduce all, so I will focus on three or four. Um, I want to look at prisoner society and agency. 
on starvation and food on the transnational society in the camp and insights in for Jewish history. And finally, on medicine and the Holocaust. I should also say, I have a bit of a cup. I don't have COVID. If I have a coughing fit, I may need to abbreviate to talk a bit. I will try not to do that. But before I go there, and Constance will help me to move to PowerPoint. Thank you. OK, uh, before I do that, a short history of uh, Theresienstadt, which was set up by the Nazis as a transit camp for pretty much all of the Czech Jews in November 41. And then also certain exception groups from Germany, from Austria, from Denmark, from the Netherlands, from Hungary and from Slovakia. Altogether, 144,000 people passed through the ghetto. About 90,000 of them were sent to the east and only 4,000 of them survived. About 34,000 people uh, died in the ghetto, majority of them elderly, about whom I will talk in just a little bit, and about 15,000 people uh, survived in Theresienstadt. Um, Theresienstadt was actually liberated one day after the end of the war on the 9th May 1945, and when I was in the position that many of you will recognize that I was looking for a good, not boring title of the book, I realized it is literally the last ghetto. It was longer than a lodge that was often called the last ghetto, at least uh, in the Western uh, world. Um, I like showing this picture that is about 20 years old because it's an aerial picture of the town as it is today. And you can see when the Nazis were looking for a holding place for the Czech Jews, this former fortress town suited quite well because you have the fortification. It was built as a kind of Wobbenian fort at the end of the 18th century to hold off the Prussian army. The Prussian army never came, but in these uh, 12 uh, barracks at about 200 houses, then um, Nazis housed um, uh, the Jews. Um, most of them were 60,000 in September. What am I doing wrong? I'm just gonna move you. Okay. I'm too tall. Thank you. Okay. Thank you. So the ghetto lasted for three and a half years between November 41 uh, to May 45. And with this mixture of ethnicities, it was truly a very much transnational history. The SS set up the ghetto and controlled it, but did not administer it. The Nazis were far too quick to figure out that bureaucracy is a lot of work and they were all too keen to outsource it to enforce Jewish functionaries. So it was the Jews who had to put together the transport list it was the Jews who decided what food will be bought. It was the Jews who decided how the very meter housing will be distributed among the people. It was also the Jews who had the job to build up uh, the healthcare out of nothing. There is in chat is best known for the two propaganda aspects, for the visit of the International Cross Red Cross in 44, and also for the propaganda movie. And yes, it is actually quite striking, but if you want to understand what actually happened inside the prisoner society, we very quickly find out that for most prisoners, that was an interesting footnote, but it did not really shape the experiences of the camp. Already in the ghetto, you had the mass narrative, that uh, prisoners kind of told about what is the meaning of being imprisoned in today's instant. It is a story that is a redemptive story, how Jews who were stigmatized, who were kicked out from their homes, who were made to wear the Star of David, made something good or to have something bad. People who used to be attorneys and physicians and their white collar jobs now excelled in manual jobs, uh, showed that they were sportsmanlike and that they could salvage something good out of this horrible place. They uh, could take care of the most vulnerable ones defined as children and produce outstanding cultural events. So you see here has kind of the birth of the legend of Theresienstadt about Brunjewan cultural events. That is something that definitely people in Theresienstadt put on, but at the same time, they celebrate that this is what they are producing. And this mass narrative in turn produced corresponding memories. I want to say very clearly, this mass narrative is not wrong. This was part of the experience of Theresienstadt, but it was not the only experience of being imprisoned in today's nature. There were other experiences. And what I do in the book is that I put these corresponding memories in conversation in a kaleidoscope and ask, what does it mean? And how come is it that we have one dominant mass narrative that kind of suppressed other experiences, most importantly, uh, the old people who were really the underdogs in today's instant. The accommodation, and I think the map shows it quite well, I was in the overcrowded ghetto, a really covered 
protected uh, asset alongside food and protection from transports in here in the map. Um, and by the way, I have my new map for the book. My partner is an architect and she drew the two maps for the residential because when I was writing the book, I really thought about people like um, my cousins, my parents, second and third generation who will be able to read the book and get a sense what they often murdered relatives uh, go through. And often people have like these last uh, IDs or letters from Theresienstadt so you can look up the map and find out where exactly where your relative was imprisoned. And if you ever visit the Czech Republic to go and see the building uh, from the outside. So that is something that I always find very nice to, when I uh, talk about the book. Um, first point that I wanted Okay, I will continue. The first point that I wanted to touch on is on prisoner society. My book is classical Jewish history of the Holocaust. I look a little bit on the perpetrators, but I do not focus on them. Um, they are two part of my history. So one of the outsets is that I, um, uh, by observing the victim society outside of the focus of the perpetrators and beyond the total focus on violence, we recognize that yes, violence was important, but it was not omnipresent. It was often not omnipresent in its physical form. And I think this is quite an important insight for our understanding how Holocaust, uh, especially for the prisoners and ghettos, uh, played out so that we do not basically go to the sources and always expect violence to be everywhere because often it's structural violence and not physical violence. And the important bit here is that yes, the prisoner society is shaped by the Nazi persecution, there is the plummeting mortality, there is the hunger, there is the fear. People don't know if they will be with their loved ones tomorrow, but the society that they produce is their own production. It's not a production of the Nazis. And I guess I really want to join the pleas of many Holocaust historians before me that we must not see the victim society through the prism of the Nazis, through the perpetrators. We need to take the sources uh, at um at hand. And here I would start kind of arguing against the classic. Uh, of Jewish philosophy that is Hannah Arendt, who of course in her origins of totalitarianism argued that totalitarian societies, the gulags and the concentration camps as the most export, um, um, extreme forms will destroy the social. That basically people will become atomized and will stop behaving in a way of solidarity and loyalty. And I thought it would be interesting to take the raising shot and look at it as a case study and when we look at it more closely, social relations continue until the very end. People decide with whom to go on transport, they close new friendships, they fall in love. The society does not destroy itself. It will continue, we just need to kind of recalibrate our view a little bit of this, what the social means. And I uh, want to uh, uh, give you a little quote from uh, my favorite uh, Czech Jewish poet, Pavel Fischl, who arrived to Theresien at the very beginning uh, in early December, 41. Um, so, and he writes, I quote, not for nothing it is said that one even gets used to the gallows. We have used, we have all gotten used to the noise of steps on the barracks hallways. We have already gotten used to those four dark walls surrounding each barracks. We are used to stand in long lines at 7 a.m. at noon and again at 7 p.m. holding a bowl to receive a bit of heated water, tasting of salt or coffee, or to get a few potatoes. We are wont to sleep without beds, live without radio, record player, cinema, theater, and the usual worries of average people. We have gotten accustomed to see people die in their own dirt, to see the sick in filth and disgust. We are habituated to wear one shirt at one week long. Well, one gets used to everything. End of quote. The society in Theresienstadt was a society created and lived in extreme circumstances that had pronounced power asymmetries with very lethal consequences. So the little bit of difference, how much food you get, how long you are protected from transport, if you have better accommodation, will not necessarily translate into class differences, but it can also mean how long you will stay alive or if you will stay alive. An examination of the society in Theresienstadt helps us to understand how people adapted to society in extremists. Now I will make a little bridge from Arendt to Lawrence Langer, and I want to be very clear here, Lawrence Langer's argument that many of you will be familiar with is about the so-called choiceless choices. He looked at the Sonderkommando as the men um, who were forced in uh, annihilation camps uh, to lead the people into gas chambers and then to burn their bodies. And he calls these choiceless choices as choices that are shorn of dignity because they are so coerced, we should not take them seriously. 
And um, when I start thinking about it, I joined a growing body of people like Zoe Waxman and Eliana Adler who said, but if you don't take these people's choices seriously, will we actually understand what is happening on in the society? So I kind of joined in to push back because I wanted to understand these people last months, last weeks, often days. And here, History of Everyday Life, that is kind of the round methodology of my book, is very helpful for us to discern how these decisions play out. And I see kind of three main fields where they play out. The decision with whom to eat food, because you only have time in the evening to share a meal, with whom to share accommodation. And if your loved ones are sent on transport to yourself, who are you going to join? I think it would be false to kind of decide or to kind of follow are people successful in surviving to only take those agencies seriously, but rather what do they see as a meaningful decision? At this moment, I will start holding my notes and say, I wrote this book, I've been fairly critical of Lawrence Langer, and then one really surprising thing happened, namely Langer sat down and wrote a very generous review of my book. And I think it is very, very beautiful of him, and I don't know if one day somebody will write their book and will be critical of my work if I will be able to do it back. So I, I do want to acknowledge that, even though I still believe that it's important that I critique choiceless choices. So I have already touched on food, and now I will zoom in on the next example, <clears throat> namely with whom do you share your food? Um, the families were accommodated separately, most of the men and women and children had different accommodation. And the one time when you have time uh, to meet your loved ones is in the evening. Quite often people meet as the mother that they take in their food. But some people start deciding, will I eat with my lover? Or will I eat with my political group? Or will I eat with the friends I made at work? Or will I eat with people from my underground communist group? And these moments are, I would say, decisions about kinship unit to which you belong that can be biological. It can be your biological mother or you know, your lover, but it can also be your friends from accommodation and so on. And these are very valid choices that people are making. And it's such an important choice because in the very little leeway you have in this enforced society, that is the one very few moments when you can actually change your life. Um, in May 42, the first Jewish self-administration on the Yaakov Edelstein, who are largely Czech Zionists, realize or learn from the Nazis that they will start sending first what are good foreigners to Theresienstadt, in people from Germany and Austria. And they also know these will be largely elderly people. And this is the moment when the Jewish self-administration decides to introduce food categories, because before everybody goes to the same food categories. I believe this is not an accident. And it's also the moment when non-workers get hands down the lowest food rations. And uh, the non-workers are the elderly people, and they get very, very small food rations. And also this food, uh, this food is the least quality food. Um, there is uh, the least protein, there is almost no vitamins, and it translates in very high mortality. On the other hand are the so-called hard laborers. And here we have a drawing by Elie um, back then Erich Lichtblau, who did his drawings already in Theresienstadt, he survived, um, then he emigrated to Israel. Uh, in between, he changed his name from more German sounding Leskli, uh, Lichtblau, to more Czech. Leskli, and then with his new Czech coined last name, he moved to Israel and he redrew his caricatures. And he called this drawing the three magi of Theresienstadt. It's the pastry baker, the baker, and the cook. And I really like this drawing because it shows you who are the big shots in Theresienstadt. And also there is much to speak about the features he gives to Stephen because these are pronouncedly Jewish features. Um, almost all of the hard laborers were people who came on the first transport. They were Czech Jews, pretty much all of them were men. Uh, and that also translated who were seen as the social elite in Theresienstadt, that people who were often protected from the transports to the East, who had food to barter, who were seen as kind of much sought after sexual partners, and then with this extra food, they were able to get extra accommodation, maybe even the much sought after so-called kumbas, kabihos, in the attics of the accommodation. On the other end of the social hierarchy in Theresienstadt were the elderly. And here we see a drawing by the Bernard architect Norbert Trolla, who drew elderly people both three cooks, you see exactly the facial features, you have just about the body types, and these people are seen 
a little bit like a garbage, a little bit like a, a mob of people looking for something. And that is what I found so striking in the sources, especially of um, the younger Czech Jews, that either they say nothing about the elderly, or they say they were disturbing, they begged for food. They did not even have like the shame to look in the garbage for any of the food, or they died quickly. And they speak this way even about their own grandparents. And what I found so striking, because I also included some quantitative statistics uh, in the book, is that the very high mortality of the elderly people um, in Theresien second I to look for the next page. This very high mortality of the elderly is not only stretched to the German and Austrian Jews whose children and grandchildren were not very rarely deported for this time, but also includes the Czech Jews. They have pretty much the same mortality. I mean, the Austrian and German Jews have maybe one or two percent higher, but the Czech Jews have almost the same. Namely, 84 people, 84 percent of the people above 60 years of age died in Theresienstadt. And if you look at people who died in Theresien, 92% of those who died here were above 60. Why is 60 a meaningful category? Because if you are a woman at majority, the elderly people in Theresien, she does something like 60 or 65% are women. You no longer have to work. And with that, you get to non-work relations. And then when you look at the mortality of the people, say, aged 50 or 40, it drops to 5 or or 3%. The second biggest mortality group is Austrian Jews around the 50 years of age and they have 12%. So you have a difference between 90 to 12. So if you are elderly and in that the probability is that you are going to die here and you are going to die around 100 days after arrival. If you are under 60 years of age, you'll be starving, you will be dirty, the bed bugs are going to bite, you will be very afraid to go on transport, but very probably you will survive until you go on transport and then then you don't know. This is smarter. In spring 1943, the head of the ghetto guard, a Berlin Jew called Karl Levenstein, visited the pathology because there was a pathology. And this is another story. And if you want, we can also discuss the assimilation of medical history. And I will talk a little bit about medical history. But Levenstein was shocked at his visit. And I quote, the corpses of those who died whom I got to see here were only bones covered by skin. These dead literally starved to death. I saw corpses who were not heavier than a small child in the hold. And when he asked the doctors what is happening, they told him this was completely normal. The starvation of the elderly in Terezin was an, Amartya, uh, was an example of what Amartya Sen, uh, this kind of scholar of famine, called that um, in situations of shortage, many more people die than would be actually proportional to the food missing because it's a study of mistribution as the misdistribution as long as there is a little bit of food missing people start kind of scrounging for food get from it a little bit more maybe barter it maybe give it to friends and then the food shortages get greater and people who are immunocompromised often it's infants but in the case of Theresienstadt start dying in much higher numbers so sure it was the German authorities who first deported Jews to Theresien, Theresienstadt and who severely limited the food supplies. But yet the actual form how food distribution took place was caused by the food categories and by corruption, and it was a consequence of the inmate society. The starvation patterns in Theresien, and I think this is important, contradicted to all other situations of scarcity because we have infants, we have small children in Theresien, not very high numbers, but we have hundreds of small children in Theresien, and very few people, very few of them die because the prison of society dictates that children are the most valuable. And the elderly, through the mass narrative, are kind of marked as the least valuable. And the prisoners saw hunger, deprivation, and dying as a mark of exclusion, which reinforced the process in which the weak elderly stood on the lowest rank. I do not say this to criticize the decision of the Jewish self-administration, but I say it as a part of history that so far has not been written. And I think we owe it to the suppressed group to at least take a face how the grounding generation of the German, Austrian, and Czech bourgeoisie, you know, the people about whom Marianne Kaplan wrote one of her most important books, The Making of Jewish Middle Class, how these people died, because they die with enteritis uh, in their own dirt, completely confused and emaciated in Theresienstadt. And we should be able to face this history, even though this is a very difficult history. 
but also food is a means of acquiring new culture and raising that. We know from the feminist scholarship, people like Cara de Silva, about recipes and recipe smoking and talking about food in Theresienstadt. But Theresienstadt is also a place where people learn new food and through food, the new learn culture. So for example, uh, the 55 year old uh, man from Berlin, uh, Richard Ehrlich uh, wrote in his diary, I quote, I only discovered millet here and I could eat it every day, end of quote. And suddenly foodstuffs, fruit and vegetable that used to be kind of walking past food like plums or cucumbers um, that, you know, walking past would be eating, but not with the bourgeoisie that would be eating, you know, lemons and oranges and pineapples becomes a stuff of like great luxury because only very few people who work in the agriculture detail for the SS can smuggle it in. And one of the shepherdesses who smuggles in half a kilo of tomato is suddenly incredibly wealthy because these tomatoes are worth so much. In various ways, our food, both giving and receiving, also served as a symbolic instrument of prestige. Elsa Dormitza was an older lady from Nuremberg who escaped from Nuremberg to uh, the Netherlands and was eventually deported to Theresienstadt. She survived and told the story that when she arrived, she met her old friend or acquaintance Leo Beck, of course, the foundational figure of German reform jury, and to accommodate her and to kind of also show that he welcomes her and send her raisin bread. And of course, it's great to get raisin bread when you're starving, but it's also a gesture of recognizing her as one of her own. And this is why she actually goes into the pains of telling us the story. The next point is on Jewishness and transnational history. The mix of inmates in Terezin reflected the heterogeneity of the Jews in pre-war Europe. Ghetto inhabitants included one magician, citizens of various South American countries, Turkey and the Soviet Union, Three Jews, that was the family of the former minister Leon Meyer, and you could recognize them. Interesting, many people remarked on that in the, um, in the diaries because the Star of David did not say Jude or Yod, but Jewish, and there were just three of them. Um, in addition to a sizable Catholic and Protestant minority, and indeed there was actually a very active Christian community in Theresienstadt and towards the end of the war, 25% of the Jews sent to Theresienstadt because everybody sent here is quote unquote racially Jewish, but many of these people identify as Christian and in the last months of the ghetto, 25% of people in Theresienstadt identify as Christian. So in addition to them, there were also 12 Adventists, four Christian scientists and three Muslims. I tried to find more about the three Muslims, but I did not. <clears throat> but while people in Theresienstadt came from six countries and spoke at, at least six languages, what developed in Theresienstadt, and I thought it was really surprising when I kind of started computing that analytically, what developed in Theresienstadt was a kind of a binary between the locals, the Czechs, and the foreigners, everybody who was not Czech. Um, there were many moments of ethnic stereotypes and othering that were linked to class, but could be surpassed. It could be surpassed if somebody was charming, social capital, or good looking. It could be surpassed if somebody could pick up languages quite quickly. And you see how even the German elderly start picking up Czech, so they sign as maminka and not muti, mama. Um, it could be surpassed through falling in love, through network set accommodation, through professional commonality. You know, if you work in a workshop with other window makers, you will make friends here and it will improve your social capital. So the reason it was a very segmented community, but at the same time, very interconnected. And even the people at the bottom would probably not be further than three people in common with the head of the Jewish self-administration. Now, where does all of this fit into Jewish history? We have much debate in Jewish studies and especially in German Jewish history, what to make of the concept of assimilation. And I have told that so much that it will come when I talked about pathology and I love the moment when somebody, I think uh, Israeli copy editor uh, commented on a text of mine where I talked about pathology and he said, it's impossible. Of course, you cannot have this section according to the Jewish medical laws. And then I said, welcome to Central European Jewish history. We know from the chronicle of the Catholic community that in addition to observant Jews, there were many artists, okay, yeah. Um, and this Catholic and Protestant group that I already talked about. But when we look at the contemporaneous self-testimonies of Czech Jews, what struck me are the many, many descriptions and emotional relationships to home. And what I have 
here is a cover of a girls' magazine uh, from um, Bonaco uh, from L414 that was led by the communist Truda Sekonyeva, who survived and who then was, by the way, one of the very few Jews who survived in function at uh, the Slansky trials in the early 1950s. And she led the children's home of a so called Geltungsjuden, of um, uh, girls of mixed marriages who were sent at their 14th birthday to Theresienstadt. So sure, they went to Theresienstadt without their parents, they were there on their own. This is also why uh, the Yuska leadership set up a special home just for them. And you see here a tree house is assigned Dobra Hill to Prague. So sure, you could say this is different, but this is kind of the tone you find over and over. There were many evocations of all sorts of Czech rituals and symbols. For instance, several inmates cut little wood lions that were very popular, and it is the double-tailed lion that is the Czech coat of arms. Uh, prisoners from the protectorate are soft singing the songs of Voskovets and Verich that were written as political leftist songs in the 1930s, but became coded as something as a statement of Czechness. At the first Christmas in Terezin in 41, people read aloud from the Bible of Kralice, that was a 16th century translation of the Bible by the Bohemian Brethren, that then became coded during the 19th century as anti Habsburg and pro Masaryk Czechoslovakia. And people are not reading the Bible of the Bible of Kralice um, because it's the Bible, but because it is coded as something Czech and as something anti German, and to kind of help understand prisoners that yes, they have been cast out as Jews. But by doing that, they are positioning themselves as kind of anti-fascist Czechs who are withstanding the German oppression. Most Czech Jews celebrated Christmas, Easter, and St. Nicholas Day. And at least on the last one, so St. Nicholas Day is celebrated one day before Nicholas on the 5th of December. And you usually have three children walking around as angel, as devil. I'm sorry to say this blackface um, at the St. Nicholas. And um, um, the Nazis, uh, the SS still forced the, um, uh, all three figures to wear the Star of David on the top of their costumes. These holidays played a much more emotional role than Passover and Yom Kippur that were also observed, but these holidays were Czech coded and gave people emotional comfort. What I found also interesting is that I find the many, many anecdotes of divorced Czech mixed marriages that end up in Theresienstadt. The people who are still sending each other parcels, but if, if these people had remained in mixed marriage, they would be deported to the in the last three or four months. And yet these marriages fell apart. So I of course thought about Tatiana Lichtenstein's book and about the importance of assimilation for Czech Jews. And I see it as two things. I see it as a lesson that uh, of course you have so many mixed marriages in Czechoslovakia and especially in Prague around 1930. In fact, about 50% of the marriages that Jews go into around 1930 in Prague are with Gentiles. But it also shows that as important as assimilation was, when they came on hard times, they did not withstand the pressure. And I know that Benjamin Frommer has been writing about mixed marriages. I'm curious what his conclusion will be. In fact, I will see him on Thursday so we can argue and disagree on this because um, I can't help but think that if you marry people, you marry them for better or worse. So when the worst times come, you should be there for them. And obviously, the Czech Gentiles were not. But beyond the layer about assimilation, I really think that my findings tell us that we should take the concept of assimilation for Czech Jews very seriously. There was also the layer how imprisonment strengthened the habitus of people. So in sociology, habitus is kind of the fabric that binds us to where we come from and what segment of society do we understand ourselves from. So I will show you an example um, as somebody who's Czech but lives in Britain for a long time. I'm somebody who likes to shop in the um, department for waitress. I love to eat cheese. We have a cat. Um, I like to read uh, good books, but and to pretend that I'm kind of educated bourgeoisie, but I still really love my Netflix and some something called Love is Blind. And this is kind of the belonging. Okay, I see some laugh. People recognize Love is Blind. Um, and with that, I kind of find my commonality and where I belong. And this habitus is then what helps people auto orient themselves in today's nature and find their kin to recognize who belongs to, little, to this group. And this is also the habitus that helps people a little bit like a compass to belong and how to make sense of this threatening environment. So in the imprisonment, Jews from Germany, the Netherlands and Czechoslovakia 
found out how much they shared with the place from which they were expelled. The reason that did not make them more Jewish. In return, they actually made them more Czech, more German, and more Dutch. And what the non-Czech Jews heard from kind of the locals over and over is, you are the foreigners. And then the foreigners, quote unquote foreigners, start identifying with that. Not only did Theresien Schaap not engender a common sense of Jewishness, this kind of point, what does it mean to be Jewish, was something that many prisoners really reflected on. It is often the story of the generation of people who were born around 1860, up to 1890, people who spent a lot of time trying not to disturb the anti-Semites and to prove to the anti-Semites that actually Jews are not guilty. And for them, there's kind of this beautiful, but also very melancholy moment that as old people, they arrive to Theresienstadt, they look around Jews and they see they have very little in common and they're just normal people. So they experience their last months before they're sent to East or before they die, just finally realizing that at the end of the day, the Holocaust made them human. A former Prague high school teacher from the fancy Stepanska Gymnasium at the Polak side, and I really love this quote. Our people are the salt of the earth, but so much salt at once, and a quote. Jewishness turned out to be a divisive and not a bonding factor, indicating that like any other ethnicity, Jewishness too is a construction. And um, Jewishness in the relationship was always a strategy of demarcation. Some people who were more religious will look at the assimilated Jews and describe them as too assimilated, too blonde, too light-eyed, too pink-cheeked, too athletic. And then the assimilated Jews would look at the Orthodox Jews or the religious Jews and describe them as too from, too different, so, so on. So I believe the thinking through these observations is a good contribution to the Holocaust as a part of both Jewish and European history. It is also part of Jewish history, but exactly in what Isaac Deutsche has called the non-Jewish Jewish history. And I think even though that these findings may not correlate with what everybody expects of Jewish and Holocaust history to be, we should not take the Holocaust history as a goose and stuff it with our expectations, but we should kind of follow what it comes from with it. And I know uh, Anna Stanchi has here written this very beautiful piece about the interview of this older guy, how it kind of doesn't correlate with the questions that he's being asked and how it doesn't expect it. So I do want to give it a boost. So the last point that I want to make, and I promised it uh, to Joanna, is on medicine. Uh, and I also want to bring it here because, of course, the book I uh, wrote is based on my PhD from Toronto, and I really wanted to write a medical chapter, and it's the chapter that I wrote after defending. So I'm particularly happy to share it today. And in a way, I structured the book alongside the everyday topics from Theresienstadt, food and hunger, society and ethnicity, culture, fear from transport and illness. And we, of course, know that illness was incredibly frequent in the Holocaust, but what does it mean and how did people come to terms with it? But even though Theresien Chat was so crowded and people were dirty and they were immunocompromised because they did not have enough vitamins, the massive spread of infection that we could see in other ghettos was avoided thanks to the management techniques of the prison of physicians. And this house that you can see, Wohen Elbe over Chlebi, was the head of the, was the seat of the main hospital in Theresienstadt, it's still there. It's a little bit dilapidated. If you visit it, the memorial, you see the house, it's the house with the smelly goats in the courtyard. And it was the said seat of the Gesundheitsbase and of the health services. Not only were people in Theresienstadt kind of medically endangered because the food was bad, there was so much dirt, there was so much overcrowding, but the Theresienstadt population was disproportionately old. In February 43, kind of in the half of the duration, Almost a third of the Theresienstadt were permanently ill, what you could call morbidity, and half of them were permanently ill elderly. But the Jewish physicians managed to get on top of that. How did they do that? Namely, they were able to pursue the SS, and they worked very cunningly with the German fear of the Jewish infection to persuade them to supply actually a lot of medication to Theresienstadt. And um, I found a couple of the deliveries to Theresienstadt and I discussed it with my friend Haru Jens, who is kind of my advisor on all things medical. And he told me, these are actually all the best medications you could go before, you could get before the end of the war uh, in Central Europe. Uh, so it was half a million crowns in August 44. 
and they've had um, medicine for pain, for dysentery, for parotyphoid, heart medication, and sulfur drugs. Of course, they don't have antibiotics because antibiotics will then come with western allies after the liberation. And we have her, yes. I will go and go back. This lady is one of the three women physicians who headed a department. She headed radiology. Radiology or x-rays is kind of a relatively new department in the 1940s. And this is why a woman physician was able to do a career. And Lily Pokorna in 43 uh, showed around a visiting Wehrmacht officer who inquired whether she had any photographic material for x-rays. She had little, she told him, often had to do with x-ray paper. But the officer from Vienna was completely amazed because in Vienna, there were often no x-ray photographic material to be had for months. It all went to the front and they have it in Theresienstadt. So it kind of shows how cunningly uh, the physicians were able to use. We also have a surviving surgery um, a diary of Eddie Springer, the head of the surgery. And we have uh, one very nice drawing of your spira of the operation of the operation room. Um, the operations were modern and complex. Uh, they operated on all the difficult things, and they did it up to the basically the best standards of the late 1930s. Still, the post-operation mortality was relatively high. Why? Because the people who are coming to be operated are often quite elderly. They come to be operated on quite late after they got sick, and also these people are emaciated. But when you look for, to go back to Lili Pokorna, and I also really like this drawing um, because it kind of shows you the very hands-on public health approach uh, that uh, that is injured physicians applied. That basically when they started checking people for tuberculosis, they would basically close down whole houses and send everybody for and enforce tuberculosis checks. And they basically did not take any protests. And with that, they were able to limit tuberculosis in the raisin shot, put people into a hospital for tuberculosis. And if they were then sent to Auschwitz, some of them actually were able uh, to survive because the tuberculosis was not quite healed, but definitely put it away. And then these people married, were sent to the Heidelberg Mountains uh, for uh, improvement, got married, had grandchildren, this one, and today I am friends. So to go back to Lily Pokorna, uh, this uh, woman physician and general that asked, you will barely find her. In the world of the doctors and in the world of the Jewish self-administration, it was quite conservative in gender questions. In fact, I would call it sexist. So I want to give the closing word to a colleague of Lili Pokorna, her nurse, uh, the Lucy Auba, who was from Breslau and uh, emigrated to Czechoslovakia from the Nazis. And in fact, she wrote a poem about her collective I want to quote the opening stanza, which I love very much. We are the Republic of Women, the place that works without males. We just look right through every man and trash him as well as his states. End of quote. One of the things that I endeavored to do in my book is to use each topic to think about the bigger topic at hand, be it food or in this case, illness and medicine. Health policy in the Nazi ghettos and concentration camps helps us understand the broader societal meaning of medicine more than just, of course, everybody's safe because they are in a horrible place. Our medical institutions, how they function and who they care for are a measure of humanity. As long as these institutions work, we can consider ourselves a functioning society. And when they fail, it's a clear sign that all societies have failed. And I think this is something we have really observed over the last three years. So to come to a conclusion, how can we write a history of, a history of society in extremists? Suffering did not heroize people. Ghetto residents were not heroic when they listened to music, and they were not monsters when they denounced others to the SS. Such judgments hinder us at more relevant questions, namely, why did people act this way? What does it reveal about a society? And I think the task of us as Holocaust scholars is to apply unsymmetrical analysis that tries to be as systematic as possible, but together to try to be as empathetic as possible, to try to understand everyone and to listen to the kaleidoscope of voices, but also ask what are the stories that are not told and why? Thank you.